There is a message from National Treasures. Please check it. Like you, it's from Earth, literally from the ground. Yet for thousands of years, it's been like this, frozen in time, gazing up at the sky. What is it doing? Keeping its chin up? Facing the challenges of life? Or does it represent a more elevated ambition? Is this the first stargazer? Maybe it's both. 7,000 years old, the legacy of the Yongshao culture. It dates from the Neolithic period, the New Stone Age, a time when people began to make elegant ground, polished stone tools instead of crude functional ones to farm and live together in settled communities. In short, to lay the foundations of civilized existence. Pottery, the art, the craft of transforming clay, essentially dirt, by means of hands and fire, was an accidental discovery that had been made tens of thousands of years earlier. It was a momentous one, full of potent symbolism. By playing with mud, humanity suddenly came of age discovered the power of creation by a process as bright and hot as the sun itself. Cold, heavy clay, the dirt into which all living things decayed, became something. A new age had dawned, one of speculation on the big issues of life, death, and humanity's place in the cosmos. In fact, this jar is just one of many perplexing and seemingly perplexed faces that stare back at us across the gulf of time, heralds of the birth of culture, of human civilization. But what of this one? Who is it? What does it mean? It's hard to say for certain even its gender, while the upturned lips, innocently imploring, suggest a child. The rotund body of the actual jar suggests a sexually mature woman. It's a symbolically pregnant combination, literally. The spout of the jar is an oval-shaped mouth and two squinting eyes, so narrow that it was surely made to serve ritual rather than practical purposes. Water, life force, flowing with difficulty from mother to child, culminating in the tears of mother and child alike that accompany the arrival of a new life. Whatever its meaning, whatever its purpose, 6,000 years have passed. The flesh and blood people who created it have vanished. Their village is gone, their rituals forgotten. But here it still is, permanent as the earth it came from, as unchanging as the heavens above, the feelings of its creators captured forever. People who suffered the pangs of birth faced up to the struggles of life and gazed in wonder at the stars. People just like us.
9,000 years ago, a crane took flight for the last time. Yet though this bird would never fly again, it would, in a sense, sing again, and in so doing, open up a new chapter in history. Whether inspired by the eerie wailing of the other cranes, we don't know. But whoever gathered up the bones of the dead crane did something amazing. Of course, with its crude mouthpiece and misaligned finger holes, it's rather rudimentary. But it's the flash of genius behind it that counts. Here we have an archetype, the ancestor of the Chinese flute. This is a Ding Shao Kui is playing a copy of that bone flute. The original was discovered at Jiahu in Huanan province, 9,000 years ago, the site of a prehistoric settlement. Between 1986 and 1987, more than 20 bone flutes were unearthed here, the oldest musical instruments so far found in China. We can only guess why these bone flutes were first made. Most likely, they were originally hunting decoys, used to mimic the sounds made by birds in order to lure prey. Perhaps the sounds they made became associated over time with the thrill of the hunt. Music was born. One especially interesting feature of the Jahu bone flutes is that they developed and improved. Whilst the earliest examples had five finger holes, later ones, seven or eight. This has a very significant implication, far from being restricted to the five-note pentatonic scale, as was once believed. The early Chinese music might have been based on a seven-note scale, like the one we use today. And even the misaligned finger holes suggest common ground with modern-day music. Working out where an irregularly shaped piece of material, like a wing bone, to make the holes must have been a matter of trial and error, as it still is even for today's top flute tuners. Nine thousand years on, what were once hunters' decoys have metamorphosed into instruments of pleasure and artistic expression. And in the hands of modern Chinese artists like Ding Xiaokui, these musical instruments, unheard for thousands of years, are singing once again. New life breathed into a long forgotten tradition, just as 9,000 years ago, our ancestors breathed life into the dead bone of a bird and produced a sound. The first faint cry of a civilization about to be born. All pottery is unique. Each piece, no matter how humble, undergoes a series of trials. Dragged kicking and screaming from the clay, pressed and molded into shape, fired, 
Only when it has survived these rites of passage does it become permanent, an object in its own right. But there's one piece of Chinese pottery that's maybe more special than any other. It's a cauldron in the shape of a hawk, just one of many unearthed ceramic objects attributed to the Neolithic Yongshao culture. It's special because, unlike most other examples of Yongshao pottery, it serves no obvious functional purpose. Questions abound. What was it for? Holding water? Storing food? Or did it serve a ritual purpose? Why is it shaped like a bird? To date, nothing else quite like it has been found. So scholars and researchers are sure to continue debating these questions. But maybe there's another possibility, that it was purely decorative. 6,000 years ago, Chinese pottery had transcended the practical and functional and acquired an artistic, aesthetic dimension. Kuo Kuo is a potter. She's especially keen on ancient animal-shaped pots like these. She's going to try to make a copy of the hawk-shaped cauldron. But making a copy is about more than satisfying a whim. After a gap of 6,000 years, there's no way of knowing exactly how this cauldron was made. Making a new one will involve a lot of guesswork on Kuo Kuo's part. Guesswork that will cast light on how master potters worked six millennia ago. The actual receptacle of the cauldron is supported by two stout legs resting on clawed feet and a tail. It's generously proportioned, perhaps hinting that a magnanimous heart beats within the chest of this bird. Overall, it's a curious composition, cute, noble, and severe, all at the same time. In fact, it's the cuteness of the hawk that gives this ancient work of art a surprisingly modern and contemporary feel, showing just how exquisite craftsmanship can speak to us move us, even after 6,000 years. The hawk-shaped cauldron is more than a handful of clay from 6,000 years ago. It's a vessel overflowing with the water from the wellspring of Chinese civilization. Perhaps more than any other, pottery is the art of time. Leave clay too long, and it'll dry and crack. Let it get too wet, it'll fall apart. It's about knowing when, as much as what. How long to fire in the kiln, how long to let it cool down. Living in an age when the pace of life has never been faster, the ancient craft of pottery has a lot to teach people today. And maybe that's the message the hawk-shaped cauldron has for us today, about the patience and care that went into its creation, a process that produced something of superb craftsmanship that endured for more than 6,000 years and now gazes out at us from its perch in the National Museum of China. What do you think of when you hear the word thin? A butterfly's wing? The edge of a coin? A centimeter? A millimeter? Or 0 0.2 millimeter? Some 4,000 years ago, along the banks of the Yellow River, the Longshan culture achieved something remarkable, a fusion of superb craftsmanship and a basic material. 
Only a few products of this union have survived down to the present day. Eggshell black pottery goblets. Wherever you look, the emergence of culture and civilization has always been heralded by mastery of art of pottery. But there's something different about the black pottery produced by the Longshan culture. Across the archaeological community, there's a general consensus that nothing from the same period rivals Longshan black pottery goblets in delicacy. What's more, the various shapes and sizes of the black eggshell pottery goblets indicate they were not mass-produced articles. It seems each one was individually handcrafted with painstaking skills. In fact, the level of craftsmanship is such that it remains unrivaled to this very day. It is hard to make pottery as thin as this, even using modern technology. So, how were they made? No one knows for sure. All we can say is that they were made on a potter's wheel, an extremely fast, accurate, and stable one. Until the kilns and workshops that produced them are discovered, we can only marvel and imagine how these delicate works were produced 4,000 years ago. It's possible to say more with certainty about the clay that was used. Fine silt deposited in ancient rivers and lakes. Once carefully rinsed and washed, it became a material of extraordinary malleability and durability. Part of the secret might also lie in the kilns used to fire them, the temperatures they could achieve, and the time these black eggshell pottery goblets spent inside them. Firing almost certainly explains the color. A technique known as sealed firing allows carbon molecules to penetrate the clay at high enough temperatures, thus coloring it before it's polished. But however it was achieved, the effect is stunning. A mysterious black metallic luster that even today, after 4,000 years, evokes feelings of reverence and awe. High-end products like these were certainly not for the mass market, so to speak. So, who were they for? And what purpose did they serve? The most likely explanation is that they were sacrificial vessels, the preserve of the elite ruling class used to showcase and highlight power and status. As it spread down the Yellow River, the pottery produced by the Longshan culture became even more sophisticated. Underlying this improved technology and craftsmanship is an increasingly more sophisticated social order. But pottery had a fatal drawback. It was weak and brittle. But times were about to change. A new material was on its way, one that would herald the arrival of a new age, bronze. This mysterious object was discovered in Wang Neo Tua Banner, Inner Mongolia. It's made of jade, and if you look carefully enough, you can make out a snub nose, bulging eyes, and maybe even scales on its chin. What is it? The flowing mane on the back of its neck could offer us a clue. Could this be a dragon, still soaring through the air after 5,000 years?
In fact, it's very similar to another jade artifact also found in Inner Mongolia, hailed by many as the very first Chinese dragon. Both jade dragons were found near Chu Feng, Inner Mongolia, the site of the Hongshan culture that emerged in the Liaohua River Basin some 5,000 years ago. The legacy they left behind was a rich one. The handiwork that has come down to us, indicating an imaginative people who lived side by side with nature. Much of the handiwork left behind by the Hongshan culture is jade. Despite their apparent simplicity, there is a sense of solemn dignity about these pieces. They must have been regarded as works of great importance, especially these, the so-called pig dragons. But the origins of the dragon motif go back much further. Fragments of pottery and shell arranged to form images of pigs and dragons have been found in sites related to the Xing Luowa culture and those of tigers and dragons in Yongshao culture tombs. Indeed, similarity between the imagery created by these two cultures is suggestive of communication between the disparate ethnic groups of ancient China of the gradual development of a common culture, one that would eventually become a distinct Chinese civilization. That's maybe what makes these primeval dragons so significant. If, in fact, these pig dragons are indeed the ancestors of the Chinese dragon, the symbol of China, what we see here is the very first stirrings of a national self-consciousness, an identity in that sense. There are ancestors, too. But how exactly did the image of the dragon that we know and love come into being? It's a process of development that can be traced by comparing the various different jade dragons. While the dragon has changed over the years, the degree of continuity over time is also striking. Like this penannular ring in the shape of a curling dragon, the dragon is something enduring, eternal, like the cycle of life itself, a fusion of past, present, and future, the hallmark of the origin of a civilization and its future. Just as people did 5,000 years ago, we gaze in wonder at this piece of jade, marveling at its purity, the sense of movement and vitality encapsulated in green stone. It's hard not to feel that it's an extension of ourselves, dancing and flying down the ages and into the future.